Welcome to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits. So get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Jonathan Malandine, and Jonathan is with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Cinder. Nice to be here. I'm so glad you're here, because I know you have a fascinating story to tell, and I might know a little teeny bit of, of what you're going to talk about, so I'm really excited to hear about it. So I know you specialize in the anthropology part at the museum, so tell us all about that. Well, the anthropology department fits into our broader mission, the mission of the museum to connect people with nature, in that humans have always been part of the landscape. And we had a very rich cultural history in this uh, zone pre-contact. And so we've been working with uh, Chumash groups for decades to um, tell, help tell their story. So you've been working with them for a long, long, long time. Yeah. All the um, local groups, the Barbareño, the Venturaño, the um, northern Chumash up in San Luis, the Chumash range from about Malibu to San Luis. From Malibu to San Luis. And are there various, I don't know, is the right word, tribes or groups or? Yeah, they're all part of a larger group, but we have the San Inez um, Mission Indians over the um, mountain. Mm -hmm. And then the Barbareño were the group that lived in this particular region, uh, hmm. centered around the Goleta Slough. Okay. Yeah. And so I heard you use a word, repatriation repatriation <laughs> tell us <laughs> tell us about that yeah so i'm the nagpra officer and that stands for the native american graves protection and repatriation act it's a federal native law native american graves, graves and repatriation act yes whoa and um that's a federal law that was established in 1990 and it basically gives indian tribes the same protections over their graves that our society has enjoyed forever and that every culture around the world has protections for the, the sacred uh, nature of their ancestors and their graves. And for many years, those protections weren't applied to uh, the Indian tribes. Really? I don't think I even knew that. Yeah. Um, so the federal law and now state law um, requires institutions like ours, universities and museums, um, to work with the tribes to identify what objects in our collection are eligible for repatriation, which means return. Mm -hmm. And mostly we're talking about ancestors, you know, some call them human remains, but we are more respectful and like to call them ancestors, and the belongings that were buried with them. And so we've been uh, repatriating for the last couple of years vast amounts of um, ancestors and their belongings to the Chumash. Gosh. Now, how long have you been doing the, the repatriation for? <laughs> why, why do I have a hard time with that word? <laughs> um, I started there two years ago. And um, just prior to my arrival in 2022, we had repatriated about 99% of all the ancestors that were previously housed at our museum to the San Inez band of Chumash Indians. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. So 99%, so I don't know, do you have a way of estimating like how many things that was or how many items? Yeah, or? so we repatriated about probably close to 2,000 ancestors and um, tens of thousands of their uh, belongings. In the past, archaeologists around here have targeted uh, cemeteries, and not just around here, around the country, um, they excavated cemeteries, and um, a lot of, you know, sensibilities have changed these days, and so uh, it's not done so much, but prior to a couple of years ago, well, we, we received our first repatriation request in 2021, but prior to that, the tribes knew that they were housed at our uh, museum, they were very carefully protected, and kept safe and sound. Um, but now, with new federal regulations, there's a nationwide push to 
to repatriate all of these to the tribes. And that's, that's happening here at our museum and at museums all over the country. Um, we're currently in the middle of a big wave of repatriations that's sweeping the nation. So do you think that most museums um, are, oh, they're eager to help with that? Or was there initially some, wait a minute, those things are ours for our museum? Yeah. Now what's the sort of mindset? I that? would say that it's, it's something of a generational shift. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd also say that, um, as I mentioned, we received the, the claim for repatriation in 2021. Before that, the tribes were all right with it. And, um, but I, I would oh. also say that there's these, this new law went into effect recently, new federal regulations that apply to that NAGPRA law that put deadlines okay. and deadlines for compliance on institutions like ours. And the reason, unfortunately, the reason that, that was instituted is that museums and universities across the country, some have been hesitant oh. or foot dragging or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, trying to find loopholes to allow them to keep these ancestors and their belongings. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, so I would say the sentiment is changing around the country and these new laws have these deadlines so they're requiring Okay. At, at the risk of non-compliance and penalties, they're mm. requiring universities and, and museums all over the country to finally get it done. Does that make sense? Okay, it does make yeah. sense. So you say you've been, you have been with a museum for two years. Mm. Did, did you come on board for that very uh, act, for that, that reason? Um, I would say that, yeah, with the, with the introduction of the Cal NAGPRA law, it's a state version. Mm -hmm. And with the, um, the new re regulations that changed just recently, that did put a lot of extra um, emphasis on completing uh, all, all repatriations over the next couple of years. Gotcha. <clears throat> so that so, is why they probably uh, hired this position. Mm -hmm. So, but you've been working in anthropology for years and years. Yes, I'm a cultural anthropologist and I come from Alaska that's where the, um, I was living with the Clinkett and Haida tribes, the totem pole carving Northwest oh. Coast tribes, and um, fell in love with their culture. It's still extremely active. And then um, got into anthropology somewhere around 2005, starting at City College, mm. and then to UCSB, oh. and then into the PhD program where I spent 10 years um, at UCSB and just uh, went to the work at the museum after that. Gosh, so you're an anthropologist through and through. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would say also there's another interesting category of, of objects that are eligible for repatriation under that federal law, NAGPRA, and it's the sacred objects. And uh, there are very few of these in collections, but they're extremely interesting. These are items, objects that were used in ceremony Mm. by native tribes that are still needed today to perform those same ceremonies. Wow. And so I was mentioning, uh, talking to you before the show about a trip I just took to mm -hmm. uh, repatriate five or six sacred objects to Southwest tribes. We also brought some ancestors for reburial up in Utah and it was uh, beautiful to have that finally completed and the ancestors at rest back where they were uh, originally from in Utah, mm -hmm. after all these years. Gosh, <clears throat> I bet that's so important to the tribes. Yeah, yeah, especially ancestors. Uh, it's hugely important to the tribes. They they want to see them at rest. They mm -hmm. want to see them um, back where they belong and with their people. Yeah. So up until this law was passed. Would you say that most of the tribe members felt like, oh, that's good. Our stuff that we value so much is in the Natural History Museum, and we know they're taking good care of it, so we're not going to worry about it. Yeah. Is that how they saw it? Yeah, and there's a lot of good relationships that exist between museums and tribes, and it is, as you say, we can provide a place where they're protected, mm. secure, free from pests, and um, temperature control, environmental control. And the tribes generally are interested in that because they want access to the, 
that cultural heritage, yeah. right? They could at any time um, come visit those objects, learn about them, have classes, maybe uh -huh. uh, reinvigorate uh, how to make things uh, that their ancestors made. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of tribes that still to this day would like that to continue and that's up to them. So we could repatriate oh. those objects in that we transfer the ownership to them and they could still request that we curate. Oh, them. okay. So, I was going to ask yeah. you if they ever say, no, no, we don't, we want you to keep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. That happens a lot. Mm. And we, and we would love to um, continue to protect that cultural heritage on behalf of the local tribes. And we, we have a very live collaborative relationship with, with the local Chumash groups. There's basket weaving classes every yeah. month. There's annual Chumash culture events. Um, we meet with them a lot. And in the future, all of our exhibits about Chumash culture will be created in collaboration with the tribes themselves. What a wonderful collaboration that is. Yeah. It's, it's only natural that, uh, to me that in the future, all museum exhibits that are talking about Native Americans should be consulting and collaborating with those tribes themselves. To let them help tell their story. Uh, yeah. You know, we should be helping them tell their stories, in other words. Yeah. So do you do any, I don't know, like education? Like, let's just say you're giving some, some precious things back to the tribe and um, you're afraid or they're afraid that, gosh, what if we don't take care of it right? I don't want it to disintegrate or something like that. Do you do any education about here's how you take care of it? It's usually the opposite. It's oh. usually the tribes that are sharing their knowledge about those objects. They, they almost universally know a lot more about their own culture than we do. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, I rarely run into those situations. In fact, these, on this last repatriation trip, we returned a sacred drum. It's a ceramic kiva drum from the Pueblo of Zuni mm -hmm. that was, it could be as old as 1850, that's used in their uh, medicine society ceremonies. And it was intact, and we just drove it out there a couple weeks ago and they're going to put it to use in their current ceremonies. And so they're far from being afraid of, oh, we're gonna mess this up. No, they're very, very happy to have it back. Another example is um, we also repatriated a medicine bundle from the Navajo tribe, mm -hmm. well, to the Navajo nation. So it's um, a collection of the tools and implements that a shaman would use for healing and ceremony. And this, collection of shamanic tools it was also very old. The Navajo Nation is going to put them back to use in their community. Though I'm sure they'll have some ceremony to cleanse it of whatever it picked yeah, up yeah. in the meantime, yeah. but um, they're going to hand those out to their current um, religious leaders and they'll be back in action. Wow. The same thing is happening with the Hopi we repatriated a Kachina mask. These are objects that fall under NAGPRA in that they're the, they're the rare sacred and ceremonial ones. Um, also, there's a category called cultural patrimony. Mm. And objects like that of cultural patrimony, they can't be owned by an individual. They're owned by the tribe uh -huh. or by a clan or by mm. the whole Indian community. And so no one person in the tribe has the right to sell it or oh. the right to alienate it from oh, the group. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 gotcha. So these are very rare objects, but a Kachina mask is one of them. And so we happen to have two of them in our collections. We return one to the Pueblo of Jemez and one to the Hopi tribe of Arizona. And uh, the representative, the tribal historic preservation officer at Hopi told me, they don't actually have that big of a space to hold these objects that are being repatriated. Oh, okay. um, so he's going to put that back into the community as soon as possible. In other words, he's going to give that mask to someone in their community who will take care of it, refurbish it, use it oh. in current ceremony uh, live. <laughs> so I, I always, I think that's wonderful when yeah, yeah. an object that's been hidden in a, a cabinet for 
decades, 50, yeah. 70 years, um, has a new life back where it came from. So you're like a hero coming in there. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we spread a lot of goodwill. The Santa Barbara I, Museum yeah. of Natural History spread a lot of goodwill on that trip last week. <laughs> so, okay, so, so tell us how that went. So what would you do, a pickup or a van or how? The museum van. Okay, yeah. the van. And how many people were in the van with you? Me and my daughter, 12-year-old daughter. Year oh. Dahlia. Oh my gosh, <laughs> a budding anthropologist perhaps. <laughs> It was a great so trip. So there you yeah. go. And was the van like full of all kinds of stuff, yep. carefully packed? Yeah, and... carefully packed crates, just as you'd imagine an anthropology expedition might look like. And um, we drove 2,400 miles all the way through five or six states. Um, it was wonderful. As I said, we repatriated um, some ancestors that were reburied in Utah uh, within Bears Ears National Monument, mm -hmm. and um, we'd just been working for like two years with a lot of the ancestral Puebloan tribes that are now in New Mexico and, mm -hmm. and Arizona and the Bureau of Land Management in Utah to establish a burial plot for ancestors like these that were removed from Utah. And so the representatives from four tribes met us there, and we... Um, Made it happen. It was beautiful. So they knew you were coming. We've been working together for two years to arrange, make the, all these arrangements. Oh. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, were there just these four people there, or to greet you, or was there a whole <laughs> bunch of people? Or? We all met up in Utah. There was five representatives from the Bureau of Land Management, which administers the National Monument. There were four elders of Acoma from New Mexico that were going to actually do the reburial ceremony. And then representatives from Zuni, um, from the Navajo Nation, <clears throat> were there to provide support, emotional support, uh, to honor the, wow. the reburial process. And Hopi, so there's Hopi, um, the Navajo Nation, and um, Zuni, and Acoma. So was there a big facility that you and everybody hauled all these things inside or was it outside or how did they? It's a private um, secret burial location because the most important thing is when we finally do all this work and get these ancestors returned and they're finally reburied, the tribes are most interested in the fact that these ancestors not be disturbed again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So wow. yeah. they try to pick uh, burial locations that are off the beaten path, that, that won't be subject to development in the future, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of these ancestors came from development uh, projects, you know, Yeah. That happens around here. Yeah, I, I, maybe your audience uh, knows or doesn't know, but there were Chumash villages all over the place in our region, and mm -hmm. so people find sensitive artifacts and even remains of ancestors oh. through erosion, you know, coming out of the beach, for example, mm -hmm. or the creek beds. They also, anytime someone starts digging around here, whether it's to build a new development or oh, maybe yeah. your garden or a pool or something like that, you're frequently finding artifacts like this that may be uh, from a cemetery. So yeah. what should they do? Give you a call? A lot of people do. Um, and we're working out ways to connect people who find such things with the proper uh, tribe and so they can directly transfer those objects. Oh, instead uh, of going through you. Right, and sometimes the, the tribes will ask us to hold on to them for a while until uh -huh. a burial is, you know, oh, ready. gotcha. And we're happy to do that too, yeah. As often as I can say, as we can say yes uh, to tribal requests, we want to do it. Jonathan, this is fascinating work. I'm so, and no wonder you're, you're so passionate about it. Gosh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm you. lucky. It's a very rewarding job, and I'm lucky to be an ally, and I'm lucky that our community is supporting these repatriations, and that our, yes. our board is supporting it, our president is leading that push. Yeah. And so there's a lot of, a lot of good feelings behind um, doing the right thing after you know, a, a long time of, um, yeah.
maybe inadvertently doing the wrong thing. Maybe. <laughs> well, gosh, I'd say our community and the museum are lucky to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing your wonderful story with us. It's my we pleasure. appreciate all your good work. My pleasure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And thanks for joining us on 805 Focus, and we'll see you next time.